Glory to God. Hey, it's good to have our missionaries home from Guatemala. All right. Thank you for making it home safely. We love you all. And I'm sure that we're waiting to see what Crystal does and Kayla does with um, maybe a little testimony night or something. Wouldn't that be kind of fun? Have a worship night and a testimony night, huh? Did you get a testimony while you were there? How about you, Dylan? Did you get a testimony while you were there? Atta boy. All right, everybody doing good? I guess we're full today. The ushers just told me they had to bring in chairs. So those of you that are in the back, welcome. All right. There's three set seats right up here in the front row, right in the spitting area, you know. <laughs> you can upgrade your seats to the spitting seats, you know. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me and turn to the book of 3 John. And verse 2, it's where we, it's our mothership statement for this series. How many of you know God wants you to prosper? I think God has a problem with poverty because poverty says people are held back from accomplishing what they can do. That's why we hate the slums. That's why we don't want people living in the Bronx. We want to fix up the Bronx. We want people to fill it and change it. We want people to come out of their poverty, not only financially, but if we can help them mentally, we'll help them overcome probably every area of their life. Amen? And so John writes to us, and he says in verse 2, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things. I like that. Everybody say all things. All things you should be able to prosper in that God sets before you. And then he says, and be in health just as your soul prospers. Say the word soul. Ready? Soul. Again, ready? Soul. You're going to see today that your soul is important to God, has been important to God for a long time. Okay? We're going to get there in just a minute. But let me read this all together again. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. For I rejoice greatly when, people, when brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you. I hope to dispel the lie, deceit, things that kept you from fulfilling and becoming what you are to become because you weren't walking in complete and total, absolute truth in God's Word. Amen. And so then it says that he, he was glad when they testified of the truth that is in you just as you walk in the truth. I might be going through the valley of the shadow of death, but I will fear no evil because the truth is in me. Amen? Amen. I'll fear no evil because I have truth that I stand on and walk on, and there's certain truths that I say, you're not going to use that on me, devil. <laughs> Amen? I just laugh at him. The last verse of verse 4 says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. The Bible says that in the last days, men's hearts will fail because of fear. The devil is arranging fear like he, you've never seen before to operate in this world like we've never understood. And it's, it's, you might say, I don't really see much fear. That's because it's so deceptive you can't detect it. It's slow, but it's coming. And it keeps growing. More and more fear should make you more and more to have a, a desire to get closer and closer to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that while terror and fear will saturate our lives and cause us to do things that we wouldn't normally do, faith overcomes. And faith says you can make it. God, you say you want us to prosper even in a world that's full of inflation, recession, obsession, possession. All these things, Lord, that the devil tries to put on us. Lord, help us to, through it all, follow you. And I ask, Lord, that you'll just give us wisdom today to take something from this message that we can fight with. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Last week we discussed that in order to prosper God's way, you've got to follow God's principles. You've got to follow His truth and walk in His ways. And so today we'll see how truth brings about change and truth helps us to fight the enemy because it's full of faith. I understand a lot of times in our lives that even though we may say, I don't fear anything, there's areas of fear in our life. If I hold a gun to your head, you're going to fear. Amen? 
If someone in the night wakes you up and they have a chokehold on you, you're going to fight and struggle. And if you don't win, you're going to fall into a, minute, a moment of fear as you're gasping your last breath. That's called real, true fear. Now, there's other kinds of fears that, that, that grip us and lock us and hold us into place. And, and that fear that is called, I called sustaining fear. It, it kind of gets, gets a place to lock into our lives. It's sustained fear that's kind of sometimes even self-imposed. It's, it's a hidden fear, an inherited fear. It's a lack of focus fear because you lost focus of what you're called to do and be, and you allowed fear to come in because you tried to become somebody else that you aren't. Don't be somebody else. Be you. You're the best impression of you. There's that perceived fear in our lives that causes us to miss out on prospering God's way. Fear will take you and, and pull you back because it puts a harness on you. And God says, I came to free you up. I came to free the saints, to free the captives, to give sight to the blind, to, to set the captives free from the prison that held them up. And I promise you today that more than ever do we medicate people for disorders, all kinds of anxieties, all kinds of things that they fall under. And therefore they, and, and I'm thankful for some of it in most cases, but, but I will tell you, maybe we should first turn to God's word. Amen. And so the Bible tells us in 1 Peter 5 and verse 8, Peter says, be sober. Come on, say it with me. Be sober. Are you ready? Say it again. Be sober and be vigilant. That means you got to be a fighter you got to have some, something inside of you because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion and he's seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith. When I think about those words, the roaring lion, and he's seeking whom he may devour. If he's seeking whom he may devour, that tells me there's people he can't devour. Amen? Did you get it? If he's looking for the ones that's, that, that he can get, he's already passed up the one he can't. My value in you as your pastor, as your shepherd, is this. That I can give you the word of God, but the word has to change you and you allow it to change you. That you change so much that the devil says, I'm not going to mess with them no more. You've heard me say this before. I pray that the devil says, I ain't going to mess with Rick Carlson no more. He, he's too powerful. He's too powerful in God for pulling down strongholds. Casting every argument and high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And he casts that thought aside and he overcomes it and lets God be the winner of the battle. Yeah. You see, if you, can, if you can be the one that he passes by because he says they're too strong, that's a position of authority. Amen? Amen. And so Jesus said, I give you authority over demonic angels, over demonic beings. I give you authority over them. Take it up and pick it up. Amen? You see, the difference between those that can be devoured and those that cannot is, listen to this, is how we respond to the roar. It's how we respond to the mesmerizing look of the lion as he looks and chooses the one that is the weakest and he gets them to look at him, him or in, in many cases of the pride, it's the females. If they, can, if they can get the prey to look at their eyes, it paralyzes. And then you get the... Did you hear that? It's just that little step... Up, okay, still paralyzed. The gazelle, the impala, the deer, the prey says, I've got time. I'm relying on my speed and my burst of speed to outburst this one. I've just got to make it past the first burst because I'm faster than him or her because they're built for strength and weight to pull me down. If I can beat them to the punch, I still got time. And you see, when we think in our minds, I still got time. I'll stay with my disease. I'll stay with my addiction. I'll stay with my issues, my mentality. I'll stay with it just a little bit longer. You fall prey. But the devil keeps coming one step. Oh, looked away. We, we can't pounce yet. They're paralyzed now. 
Now, now it's too late. Now I choose as the, as the one seeking whom I may devour. Now I choose when I pounce. I've got you held. You're close enough. I can get you anytime. You see, so the, the mesmerizing mentality is that I can bolt, I can run, I can get out of here, but you can't because the devil now has you too close and you're going to take on casualties. And so what we see that Peter tells us is you've got to be sober. You've got to be vigilant. You have got to have some characteristic traits of understanding how strong your adversary is and he's too strong for you. You're going to see that I'm going to tell you in a bit, he's so strong for you, you cannot defeat him. He says, you see, when you respond with paralyzation, you forgot who you are. You forgot whose you are. And you forgot to focus on your pathway out and away from the enemy. You see, that's a place and a position where someone says, I can do it, I can do it, I can do it. And at the moment it takes to bolt and run, they're too frozen in their place. They're standing firm. They, they forgot. They forgot to take the, mo- the, the action. They should have done it earlier. They shouldn't have been put in that position. They should have been clear away from the enemy on the outskirts of where the, where the, the herd or the flock is at. Should stay in, in, in the deep inside the, 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 the body of the church, and the body of Christ. In 1 Peter, turn with me back just a few pages. I want you to actually lay your eyes upon 1 Peter chapter 5. It says in verse 6, Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Humbling is the hardest part for us because we want to fight. We think we can make it on our own. But I promise you, you're not designed to fight fear or terror. You're not designed to fight a spirit of fear, but except who you are in Christ Jesus, that gives you the fighting capabilities. And then it's a lay down capability. It's a stand down. Completely stand down and trust Him. Complete. And then it says that He may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon Him. Everybody say, all your care. See, we want to hold back the care that we have control of. We want to hold back the things that we think we can control better than God can control for us. And so He says, cast all your care upon Him, for He cares for you. You know, the value of something is what something is, someone else is willing to pay for it. And let me tell you something, God must put a high value on our lives, on humankind, because he was willing to send his son to pay the highest price on the cross of Calvary, that he might retrieve you, redeem you, and get you back and restore you. As I look at this, we see the scripture that was on the, on the board a minute ago. It says, be sober and be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion. Seeking whom he may devour. Rest, resist him steadfast in the faith. Knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. You know, don't, don't fall victim to nobody else has to do what I go through. That, 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 there's just, we've all got things that we have to go through. We all have to work on absolving our fears. Every single one of us. And so don't make yourself a victim of, of, the, of fear, make yourself a child of God and let Him take the fear from you. You see, if you don't and you allow fear to make, become a part of your life, you, you'll, you'll do exactly what I'm, what I'm going to say next, which is you're going to let fear take up residency and become the enemy of your soul to terrorize you on almost everything you do. Terrorism is not new to mankind. Airplanes, one flew into the Pentagon... One, thankfully, didn't get to the White House, but, but was taken out and, and, and fell in, unfortunately went out and fell into a field in, in Pennsylvania. But the other one went into the Twin Towers. They were all designed, look, terrorism doesn't want your money. Terrorism wants your will. They terrorize us to break our will, to control us. Did flying change after 9-11? How we fly, remember the day when you could walk up to somebody and say, you know, a friend and say, hey, you know what, I'm not going to be able to take this trip. Here's my ticket. Would you, would you like to use it? Remember those days when you could just hand somebody a ticket and they didn't look at whose name was on it? They just, hey, off you go. Remember those days? Remember when you didn't pass through security? The, the young people in this room don't understand. We used to walk on, on the airplane with, with anything we wanted to. 
It was not checked. You were not frisked. You didn't have to go through a metal detector. They didn't check your ID. They didn't even look at your plane ticket except for to punch it so they knew you were on board. And you went and you flew all over this country. Now see what what terror did to us? Terror says, I'm going to control you. I don't need your money. I've got that working underground under other ways. I've got my, this thing funded other ways. But I'm going to terrorize you to control you. You see, that's what the devil wants for you. He wants to control you. So constantly allowing Satan to attack you with fear will cause a dullness in your godly response to fear. And you'll begin to say, it's okay. And pretty soon, you'll walk into the front room, and there it sits on your couch. Claws. As you sit down, it says, come sit down. And pretty soon, you become okay with the bondage because it's a place of security. Oh, it's sitting on your couch, it's in your house, and it's causing you to make decisions you normally wouldn't make. But because it's secure bondage, it's okay bondage. And it's not okay with God. Because it holds you back with the anxiety, disorders of all kinds, that keeps you back and has the chain around your neck to say you can never accomplish anything. So I want you to know that 2 Timothy chapter 1 tells us that God has not given us a spirit of what? But of power of love and of a sound mind so God did not give you a spirit of fear so Paul is identifying fear is a spirit fear is a spirit you cannot shoot it if I could boom I'd shoot it six times boom 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 because get out of my life get out of my apartment complex get out of my house get out of my head Are there things that you say I wish I hadn't seen because now there's an indelible mark in my brain that I don't want to see it no more, but I see it every time I look at something like it? It affects me. I've got to get it out of my heart. How do you do it? A fear, fear is a spirit. And the only way you're going to deal with it is through another spirit, a spirit of faith. Amen. Turn to 1 John chapter 5. Go there quick. 1 John chapter 5. Back to your right, over there to the epistle of John. 1 John chapter 5. Look what it says. Verse 4. For whatever is born of God. You see, listen. The way out of a spirit of fear is not by taking action on your physical fleshly abilities. Something has to be born inside of you. Revelation comes to reveal the way out. So that you don't stay in the physical place of danger and fear. And so it has to be born. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. That's the same world that John 3.16 speaks of. Where this same John writes in his gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him would not perish. We have everlasting life. But God so loved the world. He loved the world. He loves you. He loves the world and its systems. He created all things for, for you and for I and for his glory. And here he says, whatever's born of God overcomes. Now, the world that, that took on sin, the world that went south on, on us, the world that went to, to, to hell in a handbasket, the world that says, you know what? Eat of this fruit and you'll be stronger and more powerful than God. What a lie of, and deception. And then that fruit was handed to her husband, and he partook, the Bible says. Stupid is what stupid does, amen? (laughs) For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory. Everybody say the victory. How do you want to have victory over a spirit of sin or, or over the spirit of the world? And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. You see, there's a path, and it's not faith having faith in faith. It's faith in God's Word. It's faith in who God is. Is He the head of your home? Is is He the leader of your life? Does He own everything you have? Could He take it from you and and you still praise Him for it? Could He take away everything you got, burn down your house, your kids in it? Come on, Job, the spirit of Job in this place or not? Is there anyone that's ever lost everything and God said, here you go, I'm going to give it back? Put me first and I'll take you through it. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. 
Why? Because thou art with me. Come on, church. I'm going to walk you through Psalm 23 here in a minute. I'm trying really hard not to get ahead of myself. Our faith overcomes the world. Amen? It's he who believes in Jesus as the Son of God. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 1. Back to your left just a little bit. If you give me an amen here and there, I'll preach really good. I promise. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, now faith. Everybody say, now faith. That means it's right now, and you're expecting it to happen today, right now. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Now we're going to talk about some substance of faith, how faith operates, what substance says. Because now faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. And I'm dying to go right on through Hebrews chapter 11, but i got to stop there because of time and to get you to the place of Psalm 23. You see, faith, substance, and evidence work together. Hope has you dreaming, has you thinking, has you pondering. Because you see, there's a difference between having fear and being concerned. There's a difference between saying, you know what, I need to pay attention to that, and saying, I, I respect that so much, I'm not giving it a go there. I could never overcome that, is one way of thinking, and the other one says, you know what? Through Christ, all things are possible, and I'm going to overcome that in the name of Jesus. Come on. The shepherd, the shepherd is in the house today. His name is Jesus. The shepherd is in the room, and he wants you to overcome. He's waiting on you. To reach out and say, I can do this, I can make it, I'm going to overcome. But he's looking now that he can write on the tablets of your heart the substance and the evidence that will bring faith into the present of your life. So turn with me to Psalm 23. Are you still here this morning? In Psalm 23, the substance is powerful stuff. Let me say this to you. It's a lethal weapon. Say that with me. Ready? It's a lethal weapon. When you're going through something difficult that you don't know how to handle, get your butt over there and get your fanny ready to read and write and, and, and inscribe in the heart of your life what Psalm 23 says because it's a lethal weapon against the enemy. And you find out who you are. You stay, make statements of what, who God is and His power and His authority in your life. When the devil, uh, don't just put this on a funeral card. That's great and everything else, but the guy's dead. <laughs> who is he to you in your life? Put it on the funeral card of the enemy. Amen. Amen. Come on, I'm getting fired up this morning. Amen. Don't forget who you are and don't forget whose you are. You see... It's the sound of the roar. It's the, it's the grinding of the, of the lion. It's the mesmerization that he gets you to stand still and, and think you can make it. But you need a shepherd to step in with us with a rod and a staff. The Lord is. Say that with me. Come on, say it again. The Lord is. Say it again. Ready? The Lord is. Now here comes the big he of the sermon. Every single one of us ought to be able to pray this prayer. In fact, even if you're not a preacher, you ought to be able to preach this to yourself. You, this ought to be so strong in you, even if you're in the shower. I mean, come on, I had to preach in the shower before I could preach in front of you. <laughs> Yay, though I scrub through the valley <laughs> of the shadow. <laughs> <laughs> I will fear no evil. <laughs> Come on now. Come on, be preaching in the shower. I thank you, Jesus. That you're my king, you're my savior, you're my Lord. The Lord is my what? Shepherd. He's my shepherd. Come on, do you feel that in this place? Come on, man, it puts goosebumps on my goosebumps when I say, Lord, you're my shepherd. Oh, the propensity would be that the greater would own the, the smaller. But here he says, no, I'm going to let you spin it around so the devil thinks you're strong and you're powerful and he sees me and you. So you can say, the Lord is my shepherd, devil. Yeah. Yeah. 
You mess with me, you're messing with the big guy. My name's written down in the realms of glory. In the book of life. My, my name is powerful because it's hooked up with the one that has authority over all. Come on now, my boat floats on the water. It's not going down into the world. You weren't designed to sink into the world. You were designed to float on top of it. Amen. Let that picture settle in your heart. You see, sometimes when you begin to preach inside of yourself, you begin to say some things of who you are in Christ. And Psalm 23 says what it is about him. This is the big he. He is my Lord. The Lord is my shepherd. And then he says, I shall not want. Why is that? David had to sit down and think about that when I first became a shepherd. And I, and I put myself there because as a young pastor, I had to learn how to love the people that he would bring to me. Not based on if they had marks on them. Not based if they were of another color. Not based if they had pasts and histories. Brokenness. But to love every sheep that God gives me. Now first of all, I don't like being a sheep. <laughs> Let me get that right. I, I, I don't want to be a sheep. Amen? I want to be a cowboy. Because <laughs> we carry pistols. Amen? We ride horses. I mean, we call this our hippie, yippie, yuppie, guppy biker church. We're all kinds of people, so be what you want to be. But remember this, too. We're sheep. We can't fight. We can't bite. We only have bottom teeth. We have an upper palate to pull the grass up and eat it really vigilantly. But other than that... We just look up at our shepherd and say, yeah. <laughs> Amen? My friends back home, they say, Carlson, how do you preach? I say, get online and watch it. One of them watched it. He says, I died laughing the whole time. <laughs> he says, I knew you on Friday night when we used to run up and down Main Street. How are you a pastor? I said, watch it online. I don't know. <laughs> I counsel the same way. I try to make people laugh, but I get them in the Word. Because I don't sit there and say, mm, how's this make you feel? <laughs> I'm a, if I can't get the Spirit of God to work in your life, and I'm not a very good counselor. I'm not a very good pastor. The Lord is my devil. He's my shepherd. He watches over me. I'll go back to my chair really quickly. David had to sit down and say, I watched these sheep have lambs. I remember when that little sheep came out, wiped it off, watched it take its first steps, get on hooked onto its mother, learn how to jump up on the rock, missed it the first hundred times, got it on the next one. Watch that little lamb grow up and become an adult lamb and produce more. You see, as a shepherd, we started with 12, and God's given us now this church's hundreds. But every lamb to the shepherd has to matter. So let me tell you something. You matter to the great shepherd, but you matter to this shepherd too. That's why we're doing pizza with the pastor, so we can meet you, so we can greet you. Why? Because you matter. Because I remember the day you got saved. You think, how can you remember that many times? It's just something that God's given me. You tell Julie your birthday, she'll remember it forever. I get so sick of it. <laughs> <sighs> oh, today's Jake Bradley's birthday. <laughs> well, whoopie doo. Amen. I mean, I, I just have to go through it's a life. Oh, today. I'm like, I remember when they got saved. I remember when they raised their hand, came forward for prayer. I remember when they were birthed into the body of Christ. I'm not going to let the devil take them. They're my sheep. 
They're my offspring. They're my children that I got to plant the Word of God in, and they were birthed. They were born for greatness. They were born, and they have the victory which overcomes the world, which is our faith. And so you see, he developed a relationship between the shepherd and the lamb. And David was the epitome of that. The Lord is my shepherd. He makes me. I like that one. He makes me. He makes me lie down in green pastures. You know, I, I think that that's the prosperity that he has for us. It's, prosperity is relative to what you value. If you think value is, is money, God's probably going to deal with you on that. If, you, if your greatest value though can be relationship with God, you'll go a long way. For me, my greatest relationship is my, is my Lord and Savior, and that's my highest value. Then my wife and my children, and then my church people. I value you very highly. And as a shepherd, I have to lay everything down that my church will rise up. And I believe that God is using that, and it's the right way to go, and it's the way for husbands to go, it's the way for wives to go, it's for the head of the home to go, to lay down your life that the family can rise up. He makes me lie down in green pastures. I'm thankful for that. That means that there's plenty. And we've got some for others to use as well. You see, sometimes he says to me, Rick, you've got to lay down. And sometimes that means stand down. Because I have a propensity to fight. I'm competitive. I want to win. I don't want to be a lamb. I want to be a cowboy. I want to, be, I want to have fangs. And, and, and I want to claw my way out. Or I'm going to push my way out. Or I'm going to kick my way out. And God says, you're a sheep. Because fear is a spirit. And I didn't give you a spirit of fear. And if you fight that fear, you're fighting with a spirit of fear, not a spirit of faith. I'll fight. Listen to this. By casting down every high thing and every argument that comes against the knowledge and the exaltation, the power, the possession, the understanding, the anointing, the greatness, the authority by one word and in one name, I have to fight using him to go ahead of me because the battle is his when the victory is mine. Come on. Come on, give God glory in this house today. The glory is His. Hallelujah. He makes me lie down, and then He leads me. I like that one. He leads me. Aren't you glad He doesn't get pushy? Come on, man. A good friend will encourage you. A good friend will say, come on, you can make it. And that's kind of a form of leading. But I'm glad that he doesn't get behind me and shove me into things that I'm not ready to do yet. He leads me where? Where does he lead us? Beside what? That's that's important to sheep. Because covered in wool, they get into fast, deep water. And it's not good for the sheep. They can't drink it, first of all. It's too fast. I'm I'm thankful that God won't give me something too fast for me. Amen? Amen. I might be a little bit slow, but I'm right where I need to be in the still water. You see, if it's too fast, you'll get swept away and you'll drown because that wool's taking you down to the bottom. What's attached to you will take you to the bottom of the river. And you can't, all you can do is swim and try. But until you can touch the ground, you can't get out of it. And even then you'll be so heavy with all that water being absorbed into that wool. Come on, what happens? When you fall into a river, you got to get, and you have a wool jacket on, you got to get that wool off and get it wrung out and get it to where it's fluffy again and can hold in heat. The last thing you want is it for retaining water up against your skin when it's 20 below zero. That's the last thing you want. Amen? So he says, I'm going to take you to still water where you can get a good drink, a safe place where you're not swept away. Come on, I'm so glad that he doesn't try to give me something that's too fast for me. A woman that's too fast. A a husband that's too fast. A job that's too hard. A place that you can't 
find your grounding. That place of still water is a place where you'll have, take on plenty of, of liquid, take on plenty of food and substance and the refreshing, the cleansing of your body. He leads me beside still waters. Everybody say, he gives me what I can handle. I'm thankful for that. All, all I have to do, the Bible says, is get in his footprints. Not make a new print, but follow his print. I, 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 I walk where he walks. Sometimes wonder why he's going there, but I'm going to go there. Because his footprints are taking me there. I don't always know why he's going to put me in, in charge of this or that. I don't understand it, but he does. So I'll just, I'll just stay in his footsteps. I'm going to stay where he plants me. He restores. Oh, boy. Mm. He restores. Has anybody in this room been restored? Verse 3, he restores what? He restores what? That's pretty key, don't you think? Because I pray above all things, brethren, that you may prosper and be in good health, even as my, if my soul is not restored, how am I going to prosper? Anybody else in this room ever been in a place where you knew you weren't supposed to be? Done something you knew you weren't supposed to do? Hanging with people you knew you weren't supposed to hang with anymore? In that realm where they speak into your life, they talk to you, they, they encourage you, you get in trouble with them every time you go out with them. Have you ever tried to go out and do something and it just didn't work? Everybody call, you called? That's because he restored you. You tried to go out and be the old person that you used to be. You called the old friends that you used to hang with and now the, the things have been broken. You can't any longer go out with them. Now you're on your own. He restores you. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? You can't go out with them, not only because they won't answer the phone, but it's not right anymore. It doesn't work for the me who I am, because He is my shepherd, the Lord. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He gives me the prosperity that I need. He causes me to lie down in green pastures. I love this part. He restores my soul. If you've ever been in that place, then you know what I'm talking about. Well, you didn't deserve it. I hate that saying. How you doing? Oh, better than I deserve. I wrote Dave Ramsey and I said, you stop saying that. And Dave Ramsey's a little bigger than I am, I guess, on the media. But I said, that's just wrong. I am a Christian. I am a son of God. I'm a joint heir with Jesus. Come on. Even the prodigal son who was away from his father and his family, when his father saw him come and he restored him, he put a ring on his finger. He gave him a signet for signature. He put a robe on his shoulders. And he said, you're restored to full family privileges. The elder brother said, are you kidding me? Come on, there's always somebody like that in, in the church. Are you going to let them serve? They've been through a divorce. Really? So that disqualifies them from everything in the whole world and the whole life? Oh, they've got issues, this and that and another. Yeah, I know, but you know what? God's working on them. Amen? Everybody say, Here's the, here is the litmus. Everybody say litmus test. Are they on the path of righteousness? That's called the path of chances. Not a purposeful, I'm going to screw up just so I can have sin in my life and still walk a path. It still requires discipline. It requires purpose. It requires you paying attention. But the last one is, He restores my soul. He does it for a purpose because if He doesn't restore you, you'll continue to make bad decisions and you might get thrown in jail. And there he's been known to restore people. But the greatest kind of restoration that, is, that I can speak to you about is when it comes and you don't deserve it. 
and it causes you to step over into the area of, I do deserve it. Because I accepted Christ as my... I don't say that pridefully, but if I keep saying, I don't deserve this, what is, what is Jesus going to say? What, I died for you. Why do you keep saying, I don't deserve it? I value you so high, you deserve this because of who you are. The last one is this. Another, he leads me. Two, t- two times he says he leads me. I wonder if we ought to follow twice as much as we try to do the things in our own path. He leads me in a path of righteousness. Why? For his name's sake. He says, it's our family. You're part of our family. My dad once said to me, quit dragging the Carlson name through the gutter. He came to a, a, play, a drinking establishment one time to deliver his son. It got ugly. I had to crawl out from underneath a 72 Chevy pickup to save my life. <laughs> I crawled underneath there to get away from him. <laughs> crawled out the other side to run away. Because I thought he was going to kill me. But he was just going to take me to the edge. Brought you into this world and I'll take you out. Dads, we get that for free. Amen? (laughs) Let me finish up this message quick. He leads me. Think of this as righteousness as a path. It's a path. It's the greatest form of prosperity that can be offered to you after salvation. When you first get on it, it seems like it's really narrow. It's really hard to walk on this path. Do I really have to do all that stuff? Do I really have to? Well, he restores my soul, even though I didn't make it to prayer meeting. And I made a bad decision. His rod and his staff, what do they do? They comfort us. You see, that's important that you understand this. He'll use one end of the rod to chase away the wolf that you invited in, that you were too close to the edge of the herd, and you looked pretty good for dinner to the wolf. And so he came in, and the wolf got a part of things. The shepherd, the good shepherd, will take the staff and he'll butt it against his head hard and move him out and chase him away from the sheep. And the sheep will move back because they know his voice. They know the voice of the shepherd. Why? Because he was there when they were birthed. His voice was given to him. See, we're supposed to raise our children in the admonition of the Lord. Then when they're old, they'll not depart from it. Why won't they depart? Because they know the voice of the shepherd. And when the shepherd says, move aside, I got this, you say, okay, I'm, I'm, I want to be a cowboy. I want to fight that. I want to be a, I want to be a, 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 but I can't. I got to be a sheep. And he becomes fighter. And then he looks and he says, where, where's the one? Where's the one? Have you seen the one? Where's the one? Where's the one? And I go through that sometimes in my mind every Sunday when I look across this wonderful congregation and I miss just one person. And I know they're struggling. And I wonder, did I say it too harsh? Did I say it too hard? And I know that then they come back and they say, I'll I'll listen better this time because I've been out through the world. I've been in the bottom of the barrel. Don't you know, Pastor? Pastor? I went through this and your phone call meant everything. Just hearing your voice on the recorder meant a lot. You know, sometimes and even more so when you hear on the recorder of your spirit the word of God coming down and saying, I love you. Then he turns that rod around and he has a staff. It's the curly part. And he says, I found you. I put the 99 in a safe place. Got elders and deacons to do that. But I'm going to get my sheep. The one that I wiped off the afterbirth. The one that I helped him through the first suckling. The one when mama even kicked away and the family didn't want him. Didn't want her, kind of booted her away and put her aside because she had a speckle on her. She had wrongs that only had three legs. Or there's something just gone wrong. And God says, I got you right. You're part of my family. I get choked up with this. 
Because there's not a day that goes by that the devil doesn't say there's something wrong with you. Not a day that you have to overcome. To lead people, you put your big old target on your, on your chest. And he tells you all kinds of things, but I say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He restores my soul. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Because I know when I make a bad mistake, not if, but when, he's going to inform me. Because he wants to restore my soul. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, at least I'm still walking. Amen. Don't stop walking. Keep walking. Even if you make a bad decision and you turned left and went into five points in Denver. Woo! Bad place to be at midnight. You might get shot. But he says, ah, I'm with you. Even to the ends of the earth. Are you hearing me today, church? I'll restore you. I'll renew you. I'll make you, I'll make you better. So it's a path that seems narrow. And the more you walk on it, it gets wider and wider and wider. Oh, hallelujah. I will fear no evil. What, what do we do? I will fear no evil. So you see, when we're the sheep and he's the shepherd and he's the big one, Sam, you can come ahead. When we're the sheep and he's the shepherd and, and we got problems in life, you now have the equipment not to go whimper down in your doghouse with the chain on, and as all the devil has to do is rattle that chain. He comes out to feed you. He does, takes care. No, we're not going to live that life no more. We break that chain. The power of the, of the enemy is broken over your life. Stop being a victim and start being a, an overcomer, a victor. What do I do? I will not Say it with me. I will not fear. Sometimes you have to say it that exact way. And then begin to preach. I am in a bad spot, God. I made a bad decision. I let something overwhelm. There's the dime. Hallelujah. See there? <laughs> Hallelujah. If you tithe, see? <laughs> Woohoo! Couldn't see it because I couldn't. All right. So with that said. I just made a dime. God loves me. We're going to talk about that dime next week. How about that? When you're in the middle of that thing and you say, I will not fear. I will fear no evil. And then you begin to preach because the Lord is my shepherd. I don't want another one because I only know the voice of one. My grandfather said, stay there, make them give you a 30-year watch, a gold watch, because they know your voice so well, they don't want another. Be the pastor that feeds them and loves them and cares for them, that they can call at 3 o'clock in the morning, that they can call at midnight hour, that they can call in the difficulty of times. Be that pastor that's their friend, that when they're gone, they know in the back of their mind, Pastor missed us today. I have people come to me and say, Pastor, I just want you to know so you don't worry about us. We're going to be gone on vacation. Hallelujah. Just don't be gone for life. Amen? Because me and my staff, we care. We want to know if you're okay. I hope that means something to you because it means everything to me. And that was the thing that the Lord put in my heart. That I felt like I could not have a, a large num numerical church. Couldn't do it. Because I like to be in relationship with people but he's doing something that I can't control he's growing us that means we got to be real personable you got to be personable I can't get to you you got to get to me too amen because I want to I want to know you I want to know your children I want to know your children's children this summer we're going to marry like a billion kids that grew up in this church <laughs> Don't drink the water around here, I'll tell you what. <laughs> Holy cow. I mean, they're all growing up and getting married. Would you stand with me? Let's stand and close. Hallelujah. Did you get anything out of that today? Hallelujah. So you can't understand why you're overcoming the fear, but I promise you, you overcome it because it's a revealed thing. 
Everybody say that with me. Ready? It's a revealed thing. It's something that it can only be revealed to you, and therefore a spirit of faith rises up in str- inside of you. It will make a tadpole swim up to a whale and slap the piss out of him. Amen? Hallelujah. Glory to God. Did you just get a picture there of something? Amen. It makes me want to swing out on a, on a big old vine out over hell and just go right in the devil's eye. Amen? Kind of a spirit of sarcasm when it comes over me when the devil tries to get me. I'm like, you ain't getting me. I'm a child of God. Take that. I'm standing up and being accounted for. I'm sliding into heaven. I'm going to come power sliding in. Peel out down Main Street on them gold streets just to leave my mark. Amen? 70 GTO Pontiac came to heaven today. Amen? None of this ring, ding, ding power. It's like, whoa, power. Amen? V8 455. Jet rocket. That's how I'm coming into heaven. Are you with me today? Bow your heads. Let's close.